A guide to growing mint. A delicious, fragrant, and flavorful herb, mint makes a great addition to the home garden. It can be used fresh or dried and is perfect for use in salads, sauces, and desserts. Mint is known to aid digestion and is rich in nutrients. Mint varieties. Banana mint, a low growing variety that smells and tastes similar to bananas. Like all mints, it's easy to grow, and as a perennial, it will return year after year. Grapefruit mint, a large variety with slightly fuzzy leaves and a sharp citrus flavor. Chocolate mint, as its name suggests, this variety has a chocolate-like scent. It has bronze stems that contrast with its fresh green leaves. Strawberry mint, a compact variety with small delicate leaves and a mild fruity flavor and fragrance. Curly mint, a creeping variety with frilled leaves that have a strong peppermint flavor. Penny royal, a creeping, moisture-loving type with a really strong mint flavor. Mints are extremely hardy perennials. They prefer a spot that gets full sun, but will also tolerate some light shade. Mints are propagated by cuttings or by seeds, but for specific cultivars or varieties, established plants can be bought from a garden center. With an established plant, cuttings can be taken from it, or it can be divided into smaller plants. Divide and replant in the spring before it starts to grow, or else early in the fall. Seed sowing. Sow mint seeds a quarter inch deep, planting two to three seeds in each container to make sure they germinate. Later, the extra plants can be thinned out once they start growing. Keep the soil moist and maintain temperatures near 70 degrees Fahrenheit until mint seeds germinate, which usually takes about seven to 10 days. Mint cuttings. Method one, cut the mint stem just below a node which is where a leaf grows. Next, remove all but the top leaves and stick a few cuttings into a small pot with moist soil. Keep it out of direct sunlight for about a week and give it time to root and adjust to its new environment. As the mint plants grow, replant them into a larger pot or into the ground, spacing them about 12 inches apart to give them ample space to spread and grow. Transplants should be planted with their roots just beneath the soil surface. Method two, cut the mint stem just below a node. Remove all but the top leaves. Then stick a few cuttings into a glass jar with about one inch of water. Keep this cutting away from direct sunlight and change the water every day. In about a week, roots will start growing. Then replant the mint in a small pot with moist soil. As they grow, replant mints into a larger pot or into the ground, spacing them about 12 inches apart to give them ample space to spread and grow. Transplants should then be planted with their roots just beneath the soil surface. Since mints have the tendency to grow quite aggressively, they can become invasive in the garden. For this reason, mints should be placed in a spot where they can't interfere with other plants. If that's not an option, their spreading root system should be monitored. We highly suggest growing mint in containers that are above the ground. To keep the plants vigorous, we also suggest that they be divided every three to four years. To maintain their leaf flavor, flowers should also be removed as they appear. Soil preparation. For best results, plant mint in rich, moist, and slightly acidic soils with a pH between 6.0 to 7.0. Before planting, apply two to four inches of composted manure and a half a tablespoon of an all-purpose fertilizer per square foot. Work this fertilizer into the top six inches of the soil. Thinning. When a lot of seeds have been planted, they'll need to be thinned keeping only the strongest seedlings in the pot. Use small scissors to snip the weak seedlings so that the shallow roots of the other plants aren't disturbed. Container Location Mint will need a spot that gets six or more hours of daily sun.
to provide enough light for their lush growth. However, containers kept outdoors can tolerate some light afternoon shade. Containers typically dry out quicker than garden beds, so touch the soil every day and water it when the top one inch feels dry. Growing mint indoors. After growing mint in pots outdoors during the warm seasons, these pots can be moved indoors. Wait until after the first light frost because mint actually benefits from this cold weather treatment. Frost leads to a rest period and encourages new growth when moved to a warmer environment indoors. The best part of growing mint indoors is that there will be a fresh supply of mint leaves without having to brave the cold weather to harvest them. Trimming. Depending on the variety of mint that's being grown, keep in mind what its habits are. If it's a creeping variety, the plant will need to be kept somewhat trimmed so that it doesn't grow out of the container and onto the ground, where it will root itself. Remove any unwanted runners and also pinch the tips of the plants back regularly. Fertilizer. Mint produces the best flavor when it has the minimal amount of fertilization. Mix one teaspoon of a slow release 16 to 16 to 16 fertilizer into the soil, both before planting and in each spring that follows. This provides enough nutrients for the young plants for a whole growing season. Mulch. Straw, marsh hay, compost and leaves provide good winter protection for hardy perennial herbs like mint. Depending on the size of the plant, a mulch layer that's two to five inches thick will keep temperatures constant during the late fall and early spring. This limits the amount of winter damage that can be done to the plants. As well, mulching during hot, dry periods of the summer can also help maintain soil moisture. Transplant seedlings into a container filled with potting soil up to two weeks before the first frost. Beets, celery, cucumber, strawberries, radish, spinach, and turnips are all great mint companions. Mint is also a good repellent of the carrot fly, which lays its eggs around the root end of a developing carrot. Once hatched, those larvae burrow into the vegetable and cause a lot of damage. So planting mint nearby can help save carrots. As well, the sharp scent of mint, even when used as a mulch, deters both the white cabbage moth and flea beetles from chewing through the leaves of any brassica vegetable. Mint often repels aphids and spider mites, which is a big help for tomatoes. Avoid growing mint with or near parsley. Mint is a wonderful herb, but its invasive habit can make it a pest in an herb bed. Growing mint in pots keeps it contained while still providing a consistent source of fresh, yummy leaves. Mint will have enough room to grow in pots that are eight inches or more in diameter and 10 to 12 inches deep. Avoid using shallow containers though, because mint's roots might spread out of the bottom drainage hole. This can weaken the plant and can also result in unwanted root spread if the container is sitting near any bare soil. Aphids. These tiny pests come in a variety of colors, green, black, red, light orange, or yellow, and mainly feed on the undersides of leaves and stems. What they're actually feeding on is the sap in plants which ends up causing the plants damage. Aphids also leave behind a sticky substance called honeydew, and they are a pest that's known to spread diseases. Aphids can be tolerated by most plants when their numbers are low, but if there's a lot of aphids, they can stunt a plant's growth and cause a plant's leaves to turn yellow and fall off. Here's what to do. For the most part, plants can handle mild aphid infestations. But if they're found, 
A strong jet of water from a garden hose will wash them off the plants. Spraying plants with water should be done early in the morning so that the plants can dry off during the day. Sticky traps, neem oil, insecticidal soaps, and horticultural oils are also effective against aphids. Just be sure to follow the application instructions on the packaging. Oftentimes, you can also get rid of aphids by wiping or spraying the leaves with a mild solution of water and a few drops of dish soap. One variation includes adding a pinch of cayenne pepper. Soapy water should be reapplied every two to three days for about two weeks. As well, you can try to attract beneficial insects like lady beetles, hoverflies, and lacewings, all of which are important aphid predators. Make sure to check all transplants for aphids before planting. And keep in mind that aphids aren't very mobile, so it's not uncommon to find one heavily affected plant surrounded by plants that are fine. If this is the case, simply remove and destroy the infected plant. Cutworms. These are gray worms that curl their bodies around the stem of a plant and feed on it, which causes the plant to be cut off just above the soil surface. When their numbers are high, they can cause severe damage to the garden by causing plants to wilt and die off. Cutworms feed at night and hide in plant debris during the day, and they prey more on nutrients plants, seedlings, or young plants since their stems are more tender. There are a number of different types, but the most common are red-backed, dark-sided, and dingy cutworms. Here's what to do. Hand pick any cutworms from the plants after dark, when they're most active. Also, keep a three to four foot buffer of dry soil along the edge of the garden to make it unattractive to cutworms. As well, remove plant residue to help reduce egg laying sites and get rid of weeds, which can host young cutworm larvae. Be sure to till the garden before planting, which helps to expose and kill any larvae that might be present. Also, use compost instead of green manure, since manure might encourage egg laying. As well, try placing aluminum foil or cardboard collars around the plants to create a barrier, which will stop cutworm larvae from feeding. Simply place the collars around the plants so that one end is pushed a few inches into the soil and the other end is several inches above the ground. Adding a layer of mulch will also help to prevent any cutworms from reaching the soil surface. And natural predators like wasps and ground beetles also help to control cutworm infestations. Finally, try spreading diametaceous earth, essentially a soft powder made from the bones of tiny aquatic creatures around the plant's base. This creates a sharp barrier that will keep cutworms out. Flea beetles. Small beetles that are either black, a blue color, bronze, gray, or sometimes striped. Flea beetles jump when they're disturbed, and they also shimmer in the light. Flea beetles feed on leaves and seedlings, and the damage from their feeding habits can stunt a plant's growth, reduce yields, spread diseases, or kill seedlings off entirely. Young plants are especially vulnerable, while older plants can survive an infestation much better. Here's what to do. Use a lightweight floating row cover at the beginning of the season to prevent flea beetles from becoming an issue. There's also a homemade spray that uses two cups of rubbing alcohol, five cups of water, and one tablespoon of liquid soap that can work to repel these bugs. Test out this mixture on a single leaf first. Let it sit overnight, then spray the rest of the plant if there aren't any side effects. Dusting plants with plain talcum powder can also help, as well as using white sticky traps to capture these pests as they jump. As well, weeds attract and shelter flea beetles, so it's important to keep weed growth under control. Insecticides might help for about a week, but they'll need to be reapplied, and adding a layer of mulch is yet another option. Be sure to practice crop rotation and plant seeds early to give them lots of time to establish themselves before the beetles become a problem. Mature plants are less susceptible to damage, 
so make sure to protect more vulnerable seedlings. Spider mites. These tiny spider-like pests are about the size of a grain of pepper and can be red, black, brown, or yellow in color. They feed on plants, sucking on the plant juices and removing chlorophyll, which is important for a plant's ability to turn sunlight into energy. Then the mites inject toxins into the plants, which causes white dots to appear. Also, affected leaves will become dry and yellow, and those affected leaves can drop from the plant entirely. Oftentimes, there's also some webbing visible on the plant, and the plant's growth can be slowed. Typically, spider mites multiply quickly and thrive in dry and dusty conditions. Here's what to do. Monitor plants for signs of spider mites, paying close attention to the undersides of leaves. Spider mites can sometimes be controlled with a forceful spray of water every other day, and it's best to spray them in the morning hours. That's because when plants are sprayed early in the day, those plants have time to dry off, which avoids bacterial or fungal growth from taking place. Hot pepper wax or insecticidal soap can also get rid of spider mites. Just be mindful that certain sprays can also kill off the natural predators of spider mites. Since these natural predators, like ladybugs, are good bugs to have, they should be encouraged in the garden. Thrips. These are tiny, needle-thin insects that are black, brown, or light yellow in color. Thrips suck the juices of plants while also attacking the leaves and stems. Affected plants will have rough bumps, discolored speckles, or silvering on their leaves. Those leaves can then become distorted, twist, and fall off the plant. As well, thrips can spread many diseases from plant to plant. If the thrip infestation is severe enough, it can kill plants off entirely. Here's what to do. Lots of thrips can be repelled by sheets of aluminum foil that are spread between the rows of plants. Be sure to also remove weeds and debris from the garden bed after frost and avoid planting next to onions, garlic, or cereals where large numbers of thrips can build up and then transfer onto other crops. Also, use reflective mulches early in the growing season to deter thrips. Spinosad and neem oil can also be used to spot treat heavily infested areas. Finally, release commercially available predators like minute pirate bugs, ladybugs, and lacewings which are especially effective in greenhouses. For best results, make releases of these predator bugs after first knocking down severe thrips infestations with a spray from the garden hose. Finally, watering plants from above is another effective way to prevent a thrips infestation. Mint rust. Small, dusty, bright orange, yellow, or brown pustules, which are raised spots, kind of like pimples, will appear on the undersides of leaves. Eventually, those leaves will turn reddish or brown in color. New shoots might also be pale and distorted, while large areas of leaves will die, causing some of those affected leaves to drop. Here's what to do. Avoid overhead watering. Either use a drip irrigation system or can focus the water stream on the soil rather than on the leaves of the plants. It's also important to water early in the day to avoid having damp soil in plants overnight. Any infected plants and their roots should be removed to prevent the spread of mint rust. Verticulum wilt. A disease causing the yellowing and wilting of lower leaves. Also, V-shaped brown lesions will appear, and the plant's roots and stems will also turn brown. Infected leaves wilt, dry out, and eventually die, while the stems of plants might also turn black near the soil line. In general, verticulum wilt can cause the wilting, stunting, or even the death of plants entirely. The disease is typically spread between plants when infected plant material is physically moved from one spot to another. Here's what to do. 
plant high quality disease free seeds and avoid planting in areas that were previously infected with verticulum wilt. It's also important to practice crop rotation with non-vulnerable plants. In general, a three-year crop rotation is a good place to start. As well, make sure plants have enough space in between, since air circulation and ventilation is very important for avoiding disease. Do not over-fertilize or over-water plants. And when watering is done, it's best to do so in the morning to give plants time to dry off during the day. Also, sterilize any containers before use. When there are plants infected with verticulum wilt, be sure to remove and destroy the plants and also destroy the surrounding soil. It's also important to control weeds around the crops. Water crops regularly and when possible, provide crops with some afternoon shade. The verticulum wilt fungus can also be rid from the soil by using the solarization process. Simply cover the soil with a tarp, which will heat up the top six inches, 15 centimeters of soil, enough to kill the fungus. Harvesting. Mint leaves can be harvested as soon as the plants are about three to four inches, eight to 10 centimeters tall. Cut the leaves and stems with a sharp knife or scissors. When harvesting whole stems, cut the stem at about one inch, 2.5 centimeters from the soil line. Any new growth will have the most flavorful leaves. As well, any leaves that are set to be dried are best taken just as the flowers begin to appear. Note, the amount of pickings from mint can be boosted by removing any flower buds. However, don't forget that these flowers are enormously attractive to pollinating insects, and they're actually edible too. If the flowers have been picked, try using them to flavor oil and butter or as a nice salad garnish. Story. Bunches of mint in a glass of water will keep fresh for three to seven days, or when dry and wrapped in plastic, they can be stored in the fridge for a week.